Today, um, we had Dr. Giorgio Ascoli, who's going to be speaking to us. Uh, he's the head of the Computational Neuroanatomy Group at the Krasnow Institute. Previously, he was a researcher at NIH, and he has his master's degree from the University of Pisa and his PhD from Scuola Instituto of Normale Superiore, both in Italy. Uh, there's a lot of interest uh, now in sort of how mind works and what's the difference between uh, self-awareness and the physical brain that sits in your, in your head. So he's going to be talking about a boreal mind, a, a, bo sorry, a, a, bo a boreal mind, finding self in neuro cell branching. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, I want to start from uh, uh, perhaps one of the very first evidence of the linkage between trees and knowledge uh, that appears at the beginning of a very, very old book. Um, and it uh, does talk about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it also uh, is, as far as I know, the first example of a testable hypothesis in a scientific environment. Uh, because God, speaking to Adam, says that uh, if man were to eat the fruit of this tree, he would surely die. And fair enough, later on in the book, we learn that man does eat of the tree, so decides to go for the experiment, and the hypothesis is falsified <laughs> because he does not uh, immediately die as the serpent um, has told him. So I'll leave the discussion for that for the cookies and the drinks afterwards. But the painting um, uh, that you can appreciate in Madrid if you ever go there by one of my very favorite painter, Tishan, um, is um, stunning. Uh, my own interests are uh, on the very structure of the nervous system and as I will argue, that structure is complicated enough and complex enough that I don't think that we have even the hope to uh, glean um, or scratch the surface of it without using very heavy computational method. Uh, but what really drives me uh, is a passion to understand how mind works. And uh, uh, I believe that maybe the ultimate question that um, humanity um, faces is to understand uh, the scientific basis of consciousness. And I will go back to that, to that very uh, dichotomy between sci science and consciousness and whether uh, they can be bridged and how. Uh, today I'm um, um, taking a, a, a much, um, um, much easier task on, which is to just by example um, bridge that um, gap between physical brain and mind uh, in one very, very specific aspect, which I will try to illustrate. So um, since, um, since I'm setting to uh, talk about the mind, I want to uh, lay the foundations and see if we uh, can agree on at least the terms. And materialists have it that the mind is what the brain does. And being trained as a biochemist of uh, uh, at the beginning uh, went by this adage, um, but I also felt it uh, felt uncomfortable or perhaps incomplete with that. Um, and uh, when you introspect and you feel something inside, uh, it's hard to say that, um, that that is what the brain does because you don't really feel what the brain does, but you feel something inside. And there is something that philosophers of mind uh, often use, which is a term, what it is like to be. Uh, what is it like to be a bat? What is it like to be happy? What is it like to be sad? What is it like to be upset? What is it like to be interested in a scientific topic? And that's something that subjectively we can relate much more uh, directly and clearly. Uh, now, of course, this is something that when you study the nervous system uh, in a, a Petri dish uh, is very hard to tackle directly. And so I've been trying to combine these two uh, 
approaches, uh, the materialist and the idealist approach to consciousness. And I, uh, through the years, came up with this potential definition. The conscious mind is what those things the brain does which feel like something, feel like. And I put a few parentheses here uh, to help us parse this because uh, it is now finally satisfactory to me, but uh, simple is it not. So, uh, first of all, not everything the brain does uh, leads to consciousness. There's a lot of what the brain does, uh, for example, controlling your blood pressure, which is clearly unconscious. Um, and even among those things that the brain does, I would say that it's nice to think of consciousness as how those things feel that the brain does. So, with that in place, and uh, like I said, today I will only touch on a very, very simple example on the very, very complex topic of uh, the enormous uh, complexity of what the brain does and how the mind feels like. And I'll introduce the concept of neurobotanical gardens, so all those trees that are in our heads, the trees of our neurons. And uh, I will try to uh, outline in lay terms uh, what are often unspoken uh, but I believe widely believed principles of the relationship between brain and mind in neuroscience. And those are two key principles uh, that I will try to outline. And then I will introduce a third principle, which to me is self-evident, uh, but I don't believe it's as widely believed as the first two. And that's what I would like to um, accomplish today. And uh, those are all related to the relationship between uh, the branching structure of our nerve cells in the nervous system and mental states, specific aspects of mental states. Finally, if we have time, uh, I will uh, be happy always to chat about autobiographical memories, uh, which are, in my mind at least, uh, some of the most tangible aspects of conscious mental states that we can experiment on. Uh, like I said, my goal really is to try to keep this at very, very basic um, terms. Um, as I wrote in my abstracts, uh, the branching structure of trees is something that I think we all appreciate, especially in the winter when the leaves are off. Uh, you can walk around uh, in Northern Virginia or in Southern Maryland or in Washington, D.C. or wherever you live and look at the trees and think of those as neurons. Um, older neuroscientists realize that neurons look like trees. I like to think that trees really look like neurons. Uh, <clears throat> but that and, of course, the introspection, uh, thinking of our uh, own inner states is perhaps the most self-evident uh, piece of uh, observations that we can make. So I don't think that there is anything uh, not understandable um, on, on these topics. So if there is something that is obscure, uh, in what I'm saying, uh, please feel free to stop. I'm happy to take questions during the talk. Okay, so let me introduce uh, the basics here, which is a structure of nerve cells. Uh, depicted here are uh, two major aspects of uh, nerve cells. Uh, they're called dendrites and axons. On the top right of that picture is a dendritic tree, and on the bottom left, uh, an axonal tree. And uh, let me start from the axons. Uh, so these very complicated, messy guys there. Uh, axons are the outputs of nerve cells. When a nerve cell decides to send a signal, the signal propagates out of this axon. Dendrites integrate the input. So that signal from those axons eventually reaches uh, the arbors of other neurons, other nerve cells, and they land on these other trees called dendrites. So the uh, axons are the output, the dendrites are the inputs. Of course, as always, biology has uh, lots of exceptions. So almost everything you can say, you can find the counterexample. But in the vast majority of cases, these rules uh, apply. Now, axons cover most of the distance between uh, the presynaptic, so the, the cell that gives the signal, and the postsynaptic, so the cell that receives the signal. Um, but the vast majority of uh, the space is covered by the axon. So these two pictures are not in scale. And if I were to take this whole dendrite, this whole tree, and put it in this picture, uh, it would look like that white hole in the middle of that tree. So axons cover the majority of the space uh, between nerve cells. However, uh, and here is perhaps the nice division of labor between axons and dendrites, 
Axons don't really do much with that signal. They propagate that signal and all or none. Uh, whereas the dendrites do lots of interesting computation with that signal. So dendrites really transform that signal uh, throughout those branches and do real computation with it. So if you like, axons do most of the uh, carrying of the signal and uh, dendrites do most of the elaboration of that signal. And so with that goes that axons essentially carry the signal as binary, zero, or one. Uh, they are called spikes, uh, whereas dendrites essentially can use uh, a continuous of signal from a uh, very, very minute quasi-zero deflection in electrical potential in the membrane to something close to what the axons do, full-blown spikes. Now, when you think of biology and cells, you think of little spheres. Now, nerve cells have also those cell bodies, the little spheres, but they represent less than one in a thousand parts of the neuronal membrane. In other words, if you think of skin cells, liver cells, kidney cells, etc., uh, nerve cells have 99.9% uh, .9 of the membrane in these trees. They are largely axons and dendrites that we're talking about when we talk about nerve cells. Most of the energy expenditure of the neuron is done in the trees, not in the cell body. So the cell body carries out the functions that most cell bodies do throughout the body. They have DNA, they have the nucleus, they have protein synthesis, etc. But truly from the computational point of view and the signaling and the messaging point of view, the trees do the job, axons and dendrites. And in terms of the complexity of this, dendrites and axons pretty much cover the typical kind of complexity, of course at a different scale, as our normal botanical trees uh, uh, have uh, shown us. So when you think about uh, something relatively complicated like an oak tree or something uh, relatively simpler, uh, such as uh, some uh, simpler tree in front of our houses and so forth, uh, those are the kinds of um, uh, diverse arborizations that you find in the brain. And I'll show you some pictorial examples of that. Before you, oh, please go ahead. Well, the second green thing there. Yeah. Have you talked about that yet? The, the vast majority of the energy that is spent by nerve cells is for the uh, transformation and uh, transportation of the signal down the axon. Now, also keep in mind that the brain itself um, spends uh, the majority of the energy of our body uh, in spite of being a very small amount of our body in terms of weight or mass um, and so forth. So truly, uh, in terms of uh, energy expenditure throughout our lives, uh, these trees, in particular the axons, are responsible for a lot of it. So truly, if you think about a tree and you scale it down to uh, some very minute proportion, uh, you're not too far off in thinking accurately and appropriately about the structure of these nerve cells with perhaps one exception, which is that the thickness of the branches uh, would be much reduced even after scaling it down from that of a tree. So if you take a tree and you scale it down from, let's say, a hundred feet tall to uh, perhaps a quarter of a millimeter uh, and that would be your uh, microscopic size for that tree, uh, pretty much that would look like a neuron except that you have to take the branches and thin them out uh, 1 to 10. Okay, and uh, the last key point here is that you have a tremendous diversity of the shapes. So although this is an example of one particular axon in my favorite brain structure called hippocampus, and this is an example of one particular dendrite in my favorite shape, also the hippocampus, uh, the diversity of tree shapes is, is unsurpassed and in fact is again uh, uh, very actually captured by the metaphor of, of botanical trees, very much like oak trees and palm trees uh, and cedar trees are very different from each other, uh, so uh, nerve, tree, uh, nerve trees are very different from each other. So um, to give you a sense of that, this is uh, a slice of a human liver. Uh, now again, I was a biochemist uh, in my youth and so the liver uh, in my mind was something mythological because there is a lot of biochemistry going on in liver cells. But nonetheless, from the structural point of view, any one liver cell looks pretty much like the others. Uh, in contrast, when you look at nerve cells and uh, you can uh, look around uh, in different parts of the nervous system, uh, you'll find arbors that look very different from each other. 
uh, and these are all different scales. Most of these are dendrites. Um, that is an axon, uh, of course, at a different scale, and that little red dot there in the middle is the dendrite of that one neuron, just again to give you a sense of the scale. And this is just a sense of the diversity. Um, the other mind-boggling aspect is that of numbers, how many of those there are in your nervous system. Uh, this is a confocal image of uh, one part of uh, a given dendrite uh, in the cortex. So first let me talk about uh, connections among axons and dendrites. So those are called synapses, and the synapse is a contact between one axon and one dendrite of given neurons. And uh, in a nervous system, uh, in humans, we're talking about about 100 billion neurons and approximately 10,000 synapses per neuron. Uh, so of the order of 10 to the 15 synapses. Those are very, very large numbers. Now that is about the same order of magnitude as the number of real trees in the world. So one individual nervous system in a mammal typically has as many trees as how many trees you can count on the whole earth. One uh, myth that if you look at um, textbooks, they got it wrong. Uh, when you look at depictions of neurons contacting each other, typically you see these axons that extend their fingers and they touch at the terminal tips, uh, dendrites of other neurons. The vast majority of synapses are made en passant, so they are, are made on your elbows, so to speak, and along the arm, not on the fingers. A few are done on the fingers, but relatively few. And if you take the axon of an individual neuron and you sum the length, is actually about the length of a typical human finger, so it's several inches. Uh, in fact, the longest stretches of axons of individual nerve cells uh, go from the top of your head to the bottom of your spinal cord and from your bottom of the spinal cord uh, to the tip of your toes. So those are only two axons that connect the whole length of your body. But even within your brain, the whole stretch, because it's like spaghetti, it's really um, curving a lot. A uh, typical length of an axon is, is many inches. And when you sum it all up through those uh, 100 million neurons, the whole cable length in a human brain is staggering of the order of 150 million miles. So that's a very long, uh, long road. It's in fact uh, as much as all the roads, walkable, drivable, and so forth, estimated at least according to the World Wide Web, combined, that's more than 5,000 times the whole equator. And that means that if you could trace, if you could just draw on paper in real scale without even scaling it up, all the length of the connectivity of a brain, and you could draw as fast as an airplane can fly, it would take 15 years never stopping to do that for an individual human brain. So that's the kind of length and complexity that we're facing. Okay, so if you want to peruse some of this, we have a website, it's called neuromorpho.org. It has a very light sample of reconstructions of the microscopes of neurons. Um, and uh, uh, you can browse around. Uh, there are many species represented from human all the way to uh, flies and uh, below. Uh, and you can uh, browse around and, and pop it up and, and play and download data and uh, illustrate it. And this is a tapestry of a sample of a few thousand of those neurons. Each of those is a little neuron that some uh, researcher painstakingly traced on their own microscope throughout the world. And this is a zoom in of that, more zoomed in, more zoomed in, and all the way to staggering details of all the individual branches of that. So there is quite a bit of data. But this is also to give you a sense of the complexity and the diversity of neurons in various parts of the brain. Uh, and granted, most of these reconstructions are actually incomplete because of limitations in experimental technique. Yes? Um, this, like you say, the tree, and also, you know, the veins, the arteries, is, is it designed this way for the human body because that's what's needed to get all this throughout the body? Is that why that kind of design? For arteries, probably yes. You want to get them throughout your body. For uh, the trees, they're, they're, the, the, the nerve trees, they're designed that way because they have to connect. The nervous system, the, the, the quintessential characteristic of the nervous system is that it's a network. 
And having tree-shaped inputs and outputs is the most efficient way to allow those numbers of connections in a limited volume and with limited membrane. Okay, so uh, to give you a sense of how nerve uh, dendrites and axons connect, let me see if I can uh, do this. This is a, a movie that I put together of uh, the hippocampus. This is a brain structure that underlies the consolidation of memories. Uh, greens are about 5,000 dendrites uh, from neurons called granule cells, and the pink arbor is an individual axon coming from another region of the neocortex, and where the axons from this region of the cortex invades the region of the brain where all these dendrites are, uh, the branches of the axons start invading the forest uh, that is occupied by the dendrites, and there are many locations where the axons uh, come in close proximity to the dendrites, so they can make contacts at, that point, at those points. So even if uh, the axons start from very far apart from maybe another region of the brain, uh, as they invade their target region, they can make contacts. Uh, so in that case, uh, that axon out there might be uh, many, many inches away, uh, and yet it can make contacts with the dendrites uh, in its target location. Okay, so I promised that I would get to some general principles, and these general principles are usually uh, not explicitly stated. So uh, take them from here, <laughs> because usually when you go to neuroscience talks, neuroscientists are very shy about talking uh, of the mind. Uh, so here is the first unspoken principle. Mental states are spatial temporal brain patterns of electric activity. And although this is something that philosophically um, is kind of uh, borderline dualistic, uh, it's very, very hard to imagine otherwise. I think that there is ample evidence that uh, if you stop one, you stop the other, and um, if you have one, you have the other. Uh, but pretty much if you are non-committal and you don't say anything about exactly what those uh, spatiotemporal brain patterns are, uh, it must be something related to that. So after I told you uh, about the beauty of axons and dendrites, I'm simplifying them in a schematic here so I can draw you the concept. Uh, so in this case, this rhomboid here is the cell body. This blue line here is the axon. This red line here is a dendrite. This little dot is the location where this axon will make a contact with another dendrite. This little twig called a spine is the location where this dendrite will receive a contact from another neuron. And bang, that's your other neuron. So now you have two neurons, and this is a presynaptic neuron. This is the output of that presynaptic neuron. This is a postsynaptic neuron. This is the input of the postsynaptic neuron. And that's your synapse right there. This is obviously a schematic of that very complex branching structure I showed you before. So these are two neurons, and this is a network. This is a very, very, very simple network. It only has 12 neurons. A typical network like the hippocampus that I showed you before would typically have about a million neurons in a mouse, uh, perhaps between 10 and 100 times as many uh, in a human brain just for that one brain region. Now, this is just the illustration, and I also drew neurons in two different colors, black and gray, so you can understand that there may be different types of neurons that are not identical, like oaks and uh, uh, oak trees and cedar trees in this little garden. And uh, what is a spatiotemporal pattern? Well, I told you that neurons propagate information as electricity, and for now we can just consider the binary, which is the very highly simplified way that axons propagate that information, so just zero and one, and we can imagine that the neuron would just flash when it's active. So the neuron, each one neuron is either active or not, and so you can imagine that a spatiotemporal pattern of activity would look pretty much like that, for example. Let me just play that again for you, something like that. Yes? When you, when you use the term R here, mm -hmm. you know the word is has several different meanings. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we know which one you have in mind. Right. For example, I mean, one possibility is, it would be also equally correct to say that spatiotemporal brain patterns of electric activity are mental states. Would that be correct to say? Is it an equivalence, in other words? Yes. Is, is it that meaning of the word R? Or what, which of the meanings of the word R do you have in mind? Are spatiotemporal 
brain patterns of electric activity are mental states? Is that correct? Yeah, I would say so. I would say it goes both directions. So it's like an equal sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me play that once more. <clears throat> okay, so given that, and like I said, there is actually a lot that we can discuss as to what are the features of those spatiotemporal patterns of activity for which that statement is true, and if we're non-committal with respect to the details, um, that statement is likely to be true at some level and with some specifications. And it comes with some consequences, in particular because the information and therefore those spatiotemporal patterns of activity are propagated through the connectivity of the network, truly the connectivity of the network provides the constraints for what patterns of activity are possible or not possible through the network. So for example, uh, if parts of the network are not connected to each other, there is no information flow that can go from one part to the other. So physical connectivity uh, is a necessity for transmission of that information. So that means that given the structure uh, that you that structure uh, allows for certain patterns of activity and therefore certain mental states but not others. Uh, now of course the reverse may be a lot more constrained which is only a fraction of all the possible mental states that a given connectivity enables uh, is actually lived in a lifetime. Yes? Well just a question of clarification on this relationship between mental states and uh, patterns of activity. Uh, you, don't, uh, you don't mean to make them equivalent to say they have to be conscious mental states, they can be unconscious mental states. Correct. Yes, yes, yes. And, and actually this person that I mentioned here, Giulio Tononi, has a beautiful theory for what, uh, what mental states actually become conscious. Uh, and, 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 um, and it's actually a beautiful theory that, um, uh, that is perhaps one of the first that um, has the potential, at least in my mind, to, uh, to come close to the truth. But, um, but yeah, in, in this case, obviously, uh, like I said, there is a lot of what the brain does that is not conscious and uh, is still mediated by patterns of activity. Now here is a tricky part because the first principle that I mentioned, like I said, I don't think any scientist, any neuroscientist would dispute it if you don't uh, specify the details. It, it must be that it, it's, it's hard to think of, you know, it's hard, hard to think otherwise. This second principle, I would say it's a lot more controversial and you will not find it in textbooks, uh, but I would say you don't find it in textbooks yet. I think at this point there is ample evidence that that's the case but that evidence has been accumulated in the past perhaps five to ten years. Uh, so most textbooks are older than that. Uh, but I would say this generation and the next generation of students, that's what they are learning, which is learning or the acquisition of new knowledge actually implies the formation of new physical contacts among neurons. So actually new synapses get formed when you learn something. I don't know if you've noticed a change in the network but uh, focus up there somewhere, there are a couple of synapses that get formed. So in particular, when you learn something, uh, new synapses get formed and, and old synapses get eliminated. Yes? Yeah, when you talk about a synapse, um, I thought the synapse was the space in between the post and... Yeah. So... Yeah, but you have to have a physical just exposition between uh, the presynaptic, uh, it's called the axonal bouton, it's a specific part of the membrane where the neurotransmitters are released, and the postsynaptic, typically a spine, uh, but it can also be a shaft, and that's where the neurotransmitter receptors are particularly dense. So that is, you're correct, the synapse is space in the end, but it's space that corresponds between two very physical entities, which are the presynaptic and the postsynaptic uh, uh, membranes. So yeah. it's yeah. sort of defined space. It's a very well defined space. Is it the same in all the 150 different neurons in the brain? N no, every neuron is different from that point of view. Very much like leaves from different trees are very different leaves. So the oak tree leaf is different from, uh, from, the, from the fig leaf, uh, uh, but, uh, but they are leaves nonetheless. 
Yes. Anatomically and physiologically, the space is synaptic cleft, isn't it? Yeah. It's part of synapse, yeah. but the space itself is not the entire synapse. Correct. The preterminal and the postterminal and the synaptic cleft together constitute. Yeah, the whole the whole contact is the synapse. Yes. So a synapse is a thing, not an event. Correct. The synapse is a thing. Yes. In the older books, I, they, people would talk about learning as being sort of a change in the weight uh, between the... Uh, uh, I'm going to take that apart in 10 minutes if we get there, yes. Yeah. I actually have an explicit statement that says that's not the case in this framework. Oh, yeah. Does, does this leave room for the possibility that uh, learning could be the activation of existing synapses that hadn't previously been active. I think that's related to the, the previous comment and uh, uh, I would say you can almost think of a continuum there but um, I think that um, you know, in the end it's, it all depends on what we mean by learning but I'll take a hard position there and I will say when you actually learn something uh, you're actually forming synapses, you're not changing potential of activation. And by learning, I actually mean that you have a piece of knowledge in your head that you did not have before. Okay? And I'll, I'll actually make that very explicit with very specific examples there. Um, so all of this is for a human being, because, you know, animals are trained and animals learn and animals have instinct, but this is for a human being. Is that right? I'll be even more specific. That is for me. Okay, it is for me because I'm taking a very subjective stance here and I will actually uh, say that I believe that uh, other fellow humans have something similar to what I do just because I want to keep my sanity and so I would like to think that other people have also inner lives like I do and to some extent I believe that um, uh, other mammals will have something that is going to be not as close as what other fellow human beings have to what I have. Uh, but to some, some extent, it's clear that they have some states, some mental states, and uh, they certainly learn. Uh, so, um, so I would say a lot of these principles, certainly from the biological point of view, the biochemical machinery is highly conserved. And a lot of what we know about formation and elimination of synapses, we have not learned from human brains, but we have learned from animal brains. So I'm obviously extrapolating there. Okay, so very much like I said that the, the, the statement uh, of the first principle has some implication in terms of the relationships between brain and mind, the statement of the second principle also uh, has some implications. Uh, but first let me tell you that how are synapses formed or eliminated? Well, they require experience and in particular they require those uh, activations of patterns. So as you live a mental state and you activate those patterns, uh, almost by necessity, synapses are formed and eliminated. You cannot help learning as you live your mental life. However, and this is the interesting part that has always puzzled me as I was playing with learning and memory paradigms and, and trying to understand the biochemistry underlying learning and memory. There is something very, very, very intriguing, which is we can go through the very same experience, sometimes we learn from it, sometimes we don't. And it's something that it's hard to uh, put our fingers on, but truly we only learn a small fractions of the things that if you were to rewind and watch the movies, hey, why didn't I learn that? You know, I was there, I saw that, and yet I cannot remember. Why is that? So I would say in most cases, the very same experiences would not trigger the formation of those new potential mental states. So I'm going to give a few examples and, and then I'll, I'm going to try to speculate on the potential mechanisms there. So since we're at NSF, I wrote all my examples based on NSF. So suppose that you're an NSF program director and uh, as you walk into your building after parking your car on the street, you find out that due to the constructions of the new buildings around, hey, the metro bus now stops by the nearby church, for example. And uh, uh, later on that uh, week, your car gets towed and uh, you realize, hey, I can go home by metro and you use that information you learned the week before. Uh, now, your out-of-town visitor who was with you uh, is there with the same scene. They, they see the same metro bus, but they don't have the context and they simply do not learn that piece of information. Uh, 
Um, this is another equivalent example. Um, if you are a proficient piano player, uh, you can uh, glance at a music score that you had never seen before. And uh, you can essentially learn to play the piece uh, almost on the spot, maybe not masterfully, but certainly uh, you, can, you can almost tune it in your mind. Beginners players, they can read the notes, they can understand the same content, uh, and yet they cannot do the same. Likewise, if you are a good mathematician or if you are trained in basic mathematics, as you uh, dive into the specifics of the theorem that show you that uh, you cannot express the square root of 2 as a ratio of integer, which is to say that this is an irrational number, uh, you appreciate the beauty of that, of that proof and in a way you never forget it, which means that maybe five years later, uh, when, when given the same statement, you can almost reconstruct that proof. But if you haven't gone through that level of training in calculus and advanced calculus, perhaps, uh, you cannot quite do the same. And this is my favorite, of course, uh, because I'm a, a passionate soccer fan. And if you're driving on the road and, and the radio says, US and Costa Rica tied 1-1, without even hearing the rest of the sentence, you know, OK, we're qualified for the, team, for, the, for the World Cup, for example. And just you have the contract. Whereas if you do not, you know, you understand what it means that US and Costa Rica tied 1-1, but you have no idea what the implications are. So I, I'm going to try to argue that synapse formations requires more than just activity, even if that activity is present. So I'm going to step back for a, just a minute or two and give you a very brief crash course as to how synapses form during learning. And this is something that in neurobiology we learned <coughs> in the past uh, a few years. So these are axons, and these are imaged in vivo. Uh, in behaving uh, rats that uh, wander around their cages and learn stuff. And this is actually the same axon at three times uh, points uh, at different days. And these are boutons, so those are locations where a synapse could form. And you see that in this case, there is one bouton that gets formed from this day to this day. And then this bouton moves a little bit on this axon uh, at the next day. Uh, this is another example. Uh, from a different experiment, and in this case there is even more drastic rewiring where uh, there is some branch that gets formed with new boutons and uh, there seems that there's a lot of complexity forming, but then it kind of prunes back, but still what remains is very different from the first day here. So that's on the axons. Let me show you some similar evidence from the dendrites. This is a pyramidal cell. It's actually the same type of cell I was showing you at the beginning in color. And this is a mature tree, okay, so this is the adult animal. This, this stuff is not growing. And this is a zoomed in version of this. This might look like a little spine here. So this looks like uh, what could be one of those postsynaptic regions. And these are minutes. This is time lapse. So this is zero minutes, one, two, three, four, five, six. And this is a branch that actually starts growing out of this and grows quite drastically, okay? This is a different example. Again, something that looks like a spine, it essentially becomes a branch and it keeps growing in the experiment. Okay? So, in particular, new synapses can form, and at this point there is good evidence for that, both by moving, even forming boutons along the axons to contact nearby dendrites, and also when spines twitch in and out of the membrane uh, in dendrites. Uh, and those are events that happen, the, the events of the boutons moving and the spines twitching in and out are events that uh, only take seconds or at most a couple of minutes to occur. Whereas during the course of days or weeks, entire branches can appear and disappear, especially from the axons of adult animals. This is not true everywhere in the nervous system. It is particularly true in the most plastic areas of the nervous system, such as the hippocampus, and the neocortex, which are where many of our memories are stored and consolidated. Okay, so having given you this brief biological background, I'm going to state the third principle uh, of what I consider the relationship between brain and mind. And I hope that at this point it should be self-evident. Um, an axon and a dendrite must be close enough for a new synapse to form, as simple as it gets, okay? So you can form new synapses, and that's amazing because that allows you to acquire new knowledge and to 
implement and instantiate new mental states that you did not have before, but not if the axons and dendrites that are supposed to be in contact are not physically proximal in space. If they do not get close to each other, there's no way they can make a contact. And I'm going to argue with a few examples that that is a principle that actually explains why we learn some stuff and we don't learn other stuff. And particularly, what we call context, which is a very elusive aspect of our mind, I believe is very much related to the proximity between axons and dendrites in our nervous system. So for example, this is the axon of a given neuron. These are the dendrites of many neurons that are ever here and there receiving contacts. Here is a bouton, here is a bouton, here is a bouton, here is there is no bouton. Okay, so here is there is a bouton, there there is a bouton, here there is no bouton, and yet this axon is close enough to that dendrite. So if I created a new bouton there, I could establish a new contact. And I could I establish a new contact between this axon and dendrite out there? No, even if I had the right pattern of activity. Okay, so you must have both the proximity physically in space and the right pattern of activity to form a new synapse.